Seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order this meeting of the Regional School Committee at uh, 6.32 p.m. on Tuesday, June 1st. Um, and we will begin with a roll call attendance. May I call your name? Please state present. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Um, Ms. Kenny is not here. Um, Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. Mr. Stammel. Stammel present. Mr. Sullivan, not present, and McDonald present. Um, we also, um, so uh, Ms. Kenny will be joining us. Um, she will be a little bit late. And um, Ms. Kane, our student representative, is not able to join us this evening. Um, we also have um, uh, Dr. Morris, Superintendent Dr. Morris, and um, Ms. Uh, Ciela Sharkas. Our first item is to approve the minutes from May 18th, and those were included in our packet. Any discussion or edits? Ms. Stancer. You're muted, Ms. Stancer. Thank you. Um, in the in attendance section under guests, Doug Slaughter's name has got an extra letter on it, an H at the end. Um, on the second page, about in the first paragraph, a little over halfway done, we did not apply for virtual options, so this fall we will not be online, not should be inserted. Um, um, on the, the page, third page under second paragraph under superintendent evaluation process, Next to last line of the second paragraph, comments on previous versions. I believe it should be comments on previous sections. Um, we were talking about, um, yeah. Yep. And on page four at the very end, on June 15th meeting will it have the last line, superintendent's evaluation findings. I believe it's actually the superintendent's presentation of artifacts um, relating to meeting his goals for the current school year. Well, maybe that's what evaluation findings meant, but I wasn't sure. That's all I have. I think that's an appropriate edit. Any other edits or comments? Seeing none, um, I will make a motion to approve the minutes um, for May 18th, 2021 as amended. Is there a second? A second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Spitzer. Um, any further discussion? Move to a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Stammel. Stammel, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, next up is public comment, and we received no public comment today. Um, so I will just remind um, viewers that we accept public comment um, at any time um, up until 3 p.m. on the day of our meetings. Um, so uh, you can submit a public comment for our next meeting two weeks from now um, by emailing 
me at mcdonaldA at arps.org with the subject line public comment or by leaving a voicemail message at 413-345-2949. Um, and all of that information is included in each of our agendas. So we will now move on to, uh, next up is superintendent's update. And I will um, make my reminder again um, to um, our school committee members that um, this, this item is intended for the superintendent to update on us on matters of um, interest and importance for the community and for the committee. Um, we can ask questions, um, but if there's a topic that is in addition to what was covered, I ask that you bring that up for future agenda planning um, so that the committee can weigh in and, and have that discussion. So uh, turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure. Thank you, um, Chair McDonald. And so uh, I think I've got six items for tonight. Uh, one was that we had a highly successful second shot vaccine clinic. This is for 16 uh, students age 16 plus last week. It was three weeks after the first um, first shot, and we had 100% of our students who received the first shot receive a second shot, with the exception of one. But that person had another medical appointment that day, and we know rescheduled with the town vaccine clinic. So that's how we get to 100%. Uh, that didn't happen without a tremendous amount of work. I want to thank our nursing staff who made a tremendous number of they called every single family, every single student. Um, particularly our ELL department at the high school, um, again, walked students down, held hands uh, for the people like me who would have needed it um, in terms of shot phobic people, um, you know, just people were really on it. So just really happy because we know how important it is for that second shot to actually occur. And, and, you know, while there's not tons of people not getting their second shot, it still is happening both in Massachusetts and elsewhere. We have our uh, upcoming second shot for um, 12 plus on Friday. We're, it'll be at the middle school. We're meeting with the town tomorrow morning to assess whether the same outdoor um, site is better or whether we need to move to an indoor location because of the potential um, thunderstorms that are forecast for Friday. And it's not easy to quickly move a vaccine clinic inside. So uh, we'll make that announcement tomorrow. We'll communicate out. Um, everyone has the same vaccine time they had the first time. Um, they were emailed uh, about a week and a half ago about the date. And we'll send a reminder as well, because we want to make sure we get the folks their second clinic. And just again, uh, continued thanks to the town for their, uh, their work on that with us and their collaboration. Uh, kind of relatedly, um, the town of Amherst is doing really well as it relates to COVID. So the last positive case in the community was on May 20th, and that was coming from a test on May 18th. Um, so, you know, we're not out of the woods. I wouldn't use that terminology. I want to be really clear about that. And we haven't had a stretch of, let's see, May 18th, is that like roughly two weeks, something like that, with no positive cases in a very, 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 very long time. So this is good news, and we'll just thank the community for, you know, both the vaccination rate being high here, but also for folks taking it seriously in terms of um, safeguards and making some good decisions. So, uh, you know, we we'll want to keep that rolling. We'll see what happens, you know, tomorrow, every morning I get sort of the update that gets posted publicly. Um, but it, it's nice to see the goose eggs continue to come every single day. And, um, you know, so very fortunate to live in a community where people have taken this COVID safety um, with that level of seriousness. Um, third thing I have is retirement award ceremony. So it's really nice. Uh, we are having things in person again, both school, but also some other events. So the retirement award ceremony, which we have every year, um, is scheduled for June 23rd at four o'clock. And this is to celebrate folks in the district who are retiring as well as uh, folks who are at least at 15 years of service, and then every five years after that, so 15, 20, 25, and so on. Uh, so we'll do that under the tents behind the high school. Um, any committee members want to, you know, want to come? It's a really nice event. You know, please just shoot me, or actually, please shoot Debbie Westmoreland an email. She'll be much better at, at getting back to you, and she's planning the whole event. Uh, but you know, it's nice to be able to get back to that. Last year, you know, it's it's one of my favorite events of the year. Those who've been on the committee for a while. Uh, know that, um, and it's last year just, you know, wasn't quite the same, and so I'm glad to be able to get back to that. Uh, similarly, we have our graduation schedule. This Friday is Summit Academy, so that's our first one at the regional level, um, and uh, again, much like the vaccine clinic, we're looking at a couple options in terms of location, given the weather forecast that we see for Friday. 
We'll make that decision probably by the end of the day tomorrow, if not Thursday morning. Uh, we have a large number of graduates from Summit Academy this year, uh, which is great. And they're going to do some in-school kind of celebrations as well as the formal graduation. Uh, the high school graduation is at Look Park. It is on the 10th uh, in the late afternoon. And I think the committee members, you should have gotten an email from Sasha and just please confirm by the end of the day today. So uh, after the end of this meeting, I know, because uh, tomorrow we'll be get, trying to get the final information out and seats and all that. So with the state uh, loosening the restriction on outdoor gatherings, it does mean that uh, families are going to be able to see their child graduate and committee members can attend more than just the chair. Uh, it'll be a briefer ceremony than normal. Uh, my words, Ms. McDonald's words, Principal Sadiq's words, everyone's going to be very, very brief, and the majority of it will be celebrating the students and having them get their diplomas. Um, but the state guidance is very clear on having short ceremonies. So I'm more than happy to oblige uh, on my end of that. I know uh, Ms. McDonald and Mr. Sadiq are as well. Uh, some in the middle school will be, it's customarily a second to last day or last day, and that'll be a briefer one, um, probably by team uh, to reduce the number of people, but still working on that one. Second to last thing on June 3rd, which is two days from now, the, high, the middle school rather will hold its uh, climate change carnival. Um, so it's an interdisciplinary approach, uh, approach. There's hands-on workshops, guest speakers. Um, you know, so the, the staff members are Karita Wayfield, Tiffany Thibodeau, and Irene LaRoche. Um, have, have taken the lead on that, uh, and Rich Carnival, Rich Farrow is the coordinator of the Climate Change Carnival, and this is all sponsored by an AEF Amherst Education Foundation grant. So, just many one of the many ways AEF contributes is they made this possible. And again, looking forward to seeing that. I think a committee, an invitation was extended to school committee members for that as well. And the last thing is we have the High School Musical coming this week. Uh, so that schedule shifted a bit because of the weather on Thursday. Um, so it's now looking more like uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But just, yeah, you know, I've seen some of the students went over and saw them rehearsing a uh, fabulous job. Um, John Beck told is facilitating that, but the, the students, as always, take the lead. And, um, you know, really, really good experience. Hope uh, everyone is able, who is interested is able to do that outside. Uh, on the library side. Back to your old neck of the woods, uh, school committee, the old neck of the woods, that side of the high school um, should be a really, really wonderful event. So lots of good in-person things going on as well. And with that, I'll take any questions anyone has. Mr. Demley. Yeah, just a couple of on-topic comments. Um, so uh, just another shout out to Principal Sadiq and his, his team at the high school for all of the uh, flexibility they've had with graduation planning this year. Um, you know, they certainly could have taken the easy way out and, and stuck with the original plan. And the state has not been timely. <laughs> it's, uh, or given us a lot of, um, you know, uh, 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 lead time with its changes as has been typical and they've just responded amazingly there's just done a tremendous amount of, of work so i just i just really want to thank principal sadiq and um assistant principal cameron and, and and all the rest of the the staff who've, who've worked out all those logistics to make it um what will hopefully be a great ceremony um and the musical yeah um the, the only thing i would add about that is that tickets are still available so if you just google arhs um sound of music is probably the easiest way other than uh or if you go to eventbrite um, and it's it's all outside, um, a small small ceremony, so very COVID safe, and um, the proceeds go directly to rebuilding the program. It may not be well known, but the you know it takes a lot of effort and resources to put on a very large production, and so the ticket sales go into funding the next year's um, uh, production. And so with the cancellation of Spring Awakening a year and a half ago, um, you know the uh, there's a there's a tightening of resources there. So the Ticket proceeds this year will help continue uh, to keep the keep the program going. One of the, one of the largest community events at the high school, which has been really tremendous. So, I, I just wanted to thank the performing arts um, uh, heads as well for for really responding very quickly to to putting that together as well. Any other questions? Seeing none, and um, move on to our next item then, um, which is uh, the chair's update. Um, I don't have an update for this evening. 
So we'll move to uh, school committee announcements. And um, I do have an announcement here for um, the policy subcommittee um, met a week ago and we'll meet again on Thursday evening to continue discussions on um, the uh, supplier diversity commitment um, policy proposal, um, as well as any other policy referrals that come out of tonight's meeting. That is 645 on Thursday, and it will be streamed on the YouTube channel. Any other announcements from the school committee? Ms. Lloyd. Yes, I have um, an announcement from my position on the CES subcommittee, which is collaborative. They have hired a new executive director. His name is Dr. Todd Gazda, and he was a superintendent in Ludlow, and we welcome him, and we're grateful. Thank you. Dr. Marks. Yeah, I just want to say uh, Dr. Gazda is uh, incredible. He's a close colleague of mine uh, from his work in Ludlow, and I was just thrilled to see that he uh, took on that role. Um, but I think uh, for for the committees, uh, all the committees, because you know we've got the almost the five, you know, in terms of representatives here. Um, I, I think you know he's from Western Mass. He understands you know rural towns for for our three rural towns, but he also worked in Ludlow and does a lot of great work with diversity and equity. So I think we will all uh, really benefit from having Todd in that role. So thank you for mentioning. I probably should have done that myself. I appreciate it, Ms. Lord, for that. Um, and I look forward to working with him in that role, new role. Any other announcements from committee members? Seeing none, um, then uh, we can move on to our new and continuing business. Um, and tonight, um, first up, we have a discussion on um, supports for student mental health and well-being. Um, and we have several guests here. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris, to help me introduce um, who's joining us. Sure. Thank you. And 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 thanks. Uh, you know, it's too bad Ruby couldn't come, but I know she's rehearsing uh, right now, but she could always see the video and I think it was a really worthwhile topic. So uh, last month, I think, or now it's no. sometime in the next last uh, previous few meetings, uh, Ruby, who's our student rep, uh, you know, was interested in the topic of student mental health. Uh, the pandemic has had an impact on everyone's mental health and thinking about particularly our high school age students, both at Summit Academy and at the uh, at Amherst Regional High School. So we have a group of folks who are gonna do a very brief uh, overview of the work. I just wanna like frame that, that I asked them to be very brief. They certainly have more to share than we have time for them to share it. So, uh, you know, I appreciate their ability to, to talk about many, many things uh, succinctly and briefly, which they do wonderfully. But um, we, we thought we would uh, ask them to share that and then open it up for questions or comments. So. Uh, with us tonight is Karen Peters from the Bright Program at the high school, Jamie Knox from Summit Academy, uh, Principal Sadiq from the high school, Principal Slovin from Summit Academy, and there, there's Faye Brady, um, our Student Services Director. So I'll turn it over to whoever would like to start. I want to, um, just one more comment is, this has been tremendously important work for our students. You know, I think you can't read a newspaper on this and, and not read articles about the tremendous strain this has caused um, in, in all sorts of ways in terms of impact on families who uh, have been deeply personally affected by COVID themselves or, or in terms of um, relatives, the inability to see others, whether that's friends, family, uh, all around. Um, it's, it's had a major impact on mental health and I feel very fortunate that we have our team here uh, who even from last spring, I think of some of the workshops we did, um, by we I mean they, I just was the you know, talking head who is asking questions and learning a lot by listening um, to be able to facilitate this work and to really support our students in, in very trying times. So I'm not sure who is starting us off, but I will turn it over to that group. All right. All right. So I think our plan was to start with high school, give a brief update. So Karen, if you want to get started, really appreciate it. Sure, great. Um, so I'm Karen Peters. I'm a school adjustment counselor and I also um, coordinate the Bright program at the high school. Um, I'm very glad to be here and I'm 
um, really happy to ha see that wellness is on the agenda um, for the school committee. Um, so, like Dr. Morris said, we were asked to share some broad strokes around themes that our students and families and school community have been dealing with um, in this pandemic year, um, and then reflect a little bit and answer some questions. Um, you know, and as we know, as we as sort of to frame this conversation, we know that pre pandemic. One in five teens have been diagnosed with a mental health condition. So that's just sort of where we're at from a baseline and that data comes from the National Institutes of Mental Health. Um, so what I wanna share is that, you know, while we didn't do sort of a large scale data collection with every student, we know that that one in five number um, is rising um, and is um, becoming more of a concern for our students. Um, and supporting students in regulating the acute stress response that they've been living in, navigating relationships and managing their capacity to sort of re-enter um, their world and all of their developmental tasks is something that we feel really committed to as a school community. Um, so what are our students struggling with? What have we heard? What have guidance counselors heard and teachers? I just wanna give you a sampling of some of the the reasons for referrals that we've seen um, for mental health support this year. Um, I'd say first and foremost is isolation, social anxiety, um, direct impact of COVID in families around grief and loss, um, struggle um, for stability in fam for family well-being and um, financial otherwise. Um, academic struggles, how to manage um, the being a student in, in this remote world that we're living in. Um, and as I mentioned, we know that these developmental tasks of high school students who right now are supposed to be increasing their independence, moving towards goals for themselves has really been stunted. Um, and again, we believe very strongly in our role to support health and well being, in addition to supporting students in learning. Um, and we think that that's probably stronger now more than ever. Um, so I just wanna share a little bit about some of our tiered interventions that we've done. Um, and, you know, of course, we've had to pivot a little bit in these remote platforms, whether it's walk and talks on the phone um, with mental health sessions, Google Meets, and uh, other creative ways that our, our, our guidance counselors and our mental health staff have really tried to meet the needs of students and families. Um, we have really important partnerships with in place with our local mental health agencies, ServiceNet, community support options, River Valley. Um, and we also work with a lot of the private therapists in the, in the area that we really rely on um, to make referrals for community-based support. So in the high school, um, what we typically offer is what we would call typical school adjustment counseling. Um, this is my seventh year at the high school, and um, we've had more referrals for individual and group counseling than I've ever seen. So we've had over 50 referrals for individual student counseling, which is much higher than the number, which typically hovers between 20, 25. So that feels very significant. Um, we've also been really fortunate to have the support of graduate student interns from the Smith School of Social Work and UMass as well as a wonderful partnership with River Valley um, that's provided us with a tier two counselor who's been able to really get in there and meet student needs, um, you know, very rapidly. Um, so individual short-term counseling, typically four to six sessions around some of those themes I've talked about, um, connecting families, connecting kids to resources, as well as building skills to help them in their daily experiences. We, offer, we also offered um, three rounds of four to five sessions of group work. Um, the topics here were um, teen wellness, stress management, and academic organization. Um, I wish I could say that those groups were, were more, um, we had more interest um, in those groups. What we heard from a lot of students and families is, yes, we want this, but oh my gosh, we can't manage more screen time. Um, and so really trying to figure out how can we deliver the content, whether it's through a webinar or whether it's through other, other vehicles to, to get these skills and resources to students is what we've really tried to put our heads together around. Um, 
A couple other things that we've done, um, we introduced this concept of Wellness Wednesday, which I think is everywhere. Um, UMass has a wonderful Wellness Wednesday program that we sort of tapped into, and we really look forward to expanding that next year. Right now, there's tips and strategies that we post in the weekly announcements, but we have some really good ideas around expanding that for next year um, for not only skills, but community building. Um, at the higher levels of support, like for the program I run, which is bright, which is a tier 3 gen ed intervention. Um, my referrals have been higher this year than than typical. Um, notably, more 9th graders have been referred to me this year than I've ever seen before. So that that's something that I'm paying attention to and not surprised by at all. Um, in terms of, um, in addition to gen ed supports, there's also at the high school. Mental health counselors who are doing special education counseling um, and consultation with teachers and families as well. Um, what's next? I, I think that themes that we really hope to continue to build on again, I, I brought up the idea of that students and families living in this acute stress response place after being in a pandemic, being afraid um, of so many things, and really working at what skills can we. Can we bring to all of our students and staff and families to help them regulate those things, whether it's mindfulness or emotion regulation or other things that we can um, that we can infuse in the things that we're already doing? Um, so I'm going to stop there and hope that I was brief enough, um, and I'm happy to answer questions um, when my good friend Jamie is done speaking next. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to echo what Karen said. I'm, I'm really grateful that mental health was put on the agenda. And I, I think it's even more kind of delightful that it was uh, brought up by the, the student representative. Um, so I am Jamie Knox. I'm a clinical social worker and I'm one of two clinicians at Summit Academy. You all know this is our in-district public day high school um, for students with IEPs in grades 8 through 12 who benefit from a therapeutic setting to further support and address their individual needs. Um, listening with Karen talk, I would say that I agree when she discusses what our students and families are dealing with in terms of presenting issues around isolation, um, increase in anxiety, uh, feelings of depression, loss, grief, family struggle, not to mention academic challenges. Um, so at Summit, we were we did have pretty strong student engagement and attendance while we were completely remote um, and still do currently for those students who who continue to be remote. Myself and my co-clinician, uh, Aaron Edinson, began using Google Voice early on. Uh, it was an on the fly intervention that has paid dividends. Um, it, it's been an amazing resource. So we've been able to use this to text families and students in the moment um, in their native language with the addition of the, the Google Translate app. Um, and we've just been really um, uh, grateful at how effective this, this intervention has been in the overall engagement of our, of our students at Summit. Um, whether it was, you know, prompting a student to log in, partnering with a parent to help them log in when a parent was at work and we needed to text quickly, um, troubleshooting or understanding why they weren't logging in, and then building um, interventions as needed for, for individual students and families. So every student at Summit is receiving pre-COVID and currently um, a minimum of weekly individual counseling between 30 and 90 minutes based on their IEP, uh, weekly small group, either DBT or CBT, which is part of our social emotional learning curriculum. We have weekly community meetings um, focused on community building, which is a, a huge part of who we are coming together, mindfulness practice, which is a cornerstone of our milieu, um, teaching restorative practices kind of rooted in circles, engaging with one another, um, managing conflict in the moment, talking through things, acknowledging one another, supporting one another. Um, and we have a rotating repertoire of, of other groups that occur kind of monthly. Um, so all of these interventions at Summit during this time um, and moving forward allow us to assess how the students are doing contact and collaborate with our families when there's a change in their students' attendance or engagement, um, better assess in individual and group counseling sessions how our students are managing and feeling and how to support them, um, and also to make appropriate referrals to community providers. 
The clinicians collaborate regularly with outpatient and community providers. Um, so we're looking at other therapists, case managers, primary care, DCF, et cetera, um, that our students and families are working with so that we can ensure as much as possible that the whole student needs are being addressed. Um, and also clinicians at, at Summit consult with staff, paras, and teachers throughout the day as needed, um, which has become an ongoing uh, <laughs> daily all staff Google chat. And I laugh because it's just, it's, it's a very intense and very effective way of communicating with one another. It's all day long. We're checking in about how a student is looking in the classroom. It's how I find out if somebody hasn't arrived, which prompts me to reach out to kids and families. Um, and then we also consult weekly in, in scheduled weekly staff meetings about specific interventions and techniques that address and reinforce our students' social and emotional skill development. So um, I would say in closing, before we take some questions, that I am consistently buoyed by the resilience of our students, of how they've adapted to the circumstances of this last year. Um, we're continually looking for ways to encourage and help them channel their energy into gratifying pursuits, be it activism or finding creative outlets. Um, and there's something real to be said about them realizing their own strength around how to adapt to adversity now and for the future. So um, that said, we do have concerns that we're being alert to. Um, there's really long waiting lists and, and lack of access to mental health resources in the community right now. And I think that only underscores the importance of um, mental health interventions in the public schools right now. Um, as for many families, we are kind of the main provider. Um, you know, we don't know as yet potential kind of long-term impact uh, for our high schoolers transitioning into young adulthood um, based on this last year. Um, and as always, the crucial need to continue to be supportive of families who will continue to be under stress as the school and the world reopens. Um, so yeah, we're remaining really vigilant and uh, connected with our students and families around those things. So thank you. And Karen and I are happy to take any questions. Mr. Stanoff. Yeah, being new to the committee, I was just curious how many students are enrolled at a summit and how, how it's determined who, who enrolls. Sure. Well, Great. Oh, Great. I, I was going to let Dave answer that, but you're welcome sure. to go in. I was just trying to, you, you, you know, trying to spread the spread the load to Dave. Sure, if you're sure. okay answering that. I'm and I'm sorry if people already know this, but I just no, no, that's a great question. It's a great question. And Jamie knows it as well. So it's so um everybody that's at Summit is um has gone through the IEP process. So they're all students on on IEPs. Um and we're a day school, which means um uh, we're as as far out on the least restrictive environment, which is a, a key term in in uh, special ed as you can go publicly. So the next step is a private day school. And so we've done this and uh, we've had a public day school in our system for many, many years. Um, and it's looked in lots of different ways. And so that's that just gives you the history of that. And we have about, right now, I think we have about 26 students. We also take in tuitioned in students from other communities and we've done that for years. And interestingly enough, that number has risen in the last you know, six to eight months that people are looking for uh, placements that they can't, but they want to be as close to the public school as possible. And we're one of those in our local community. And we've always been there for Northampton, South Hadley and others. And, and, um, and so that's what we offer. Um, I, I, I just wanted just a real plug. My clinicians and Karen Peters have been just stalwarts I'm um, just, I, it, it, I almost get emotional thinking about the level of work and commitment they have had towards our students uh, every day of the week, right? So every day of the week during vacations, every day of the week during summer. And it's not the way it has to be, but it's the way it needed to be. And they stepped up and, um, and it just, it, and, it, and you see the difference. That's the key. You see the difference in the students. And um, I really appreciate that. And I couldn't not go on without saying that. I hope that answered your question. Thank you for asking that question because I think it's always helpful for us to um, 
and in, in our community to be reminded of, of um, the role and, and uniqueness of Summit County. Are there other questions? Mr. Demling. Yeah, so thank you so much for this um, for this talk. I, I love hearing from staff who are like on the direct front lines of this this stuff. So it's really it adds a lot of color to the abstractness that we usually talk about at the, at the school committee. So I um, appreciate that. The, the, the two questions I had were, um, are there already specific resources, whether it's staffing or technology or something else that you're thinking of would be really helpful in the coming years as we help kids recover from COVID? And the specific reason I ask is that you, you may know that we have um, a, a certain amount of funds from federal stimulus dollars. It's about 1.6 million over a maximum of the next four fiscal years um, to spend specifically for things that COVID has impacted. And obviously mental health uh, supports is, is like right down that main street. So it doesn't have to be right now, you know, maybe, you know, in the coming weeks and months as you're thinking, but if you have ideas tonight, that that's great. But it's, it's something we're really going to be trying to engage the community on and, and wanting to, to get the most, impact for you know and this is definitely something that we want to be uh be, be alerted to the, the other thing so that's one question if, if if you have thoughts now the other one is is about um referrals and i'm just curious about about the, the methods of how uh students at the region the middle school and the high school are able to self-refer like is it is it is it easy to drop in anonymously like without stigma i mean obviously you know it's better than anybody that mental health still has you know, too much of a stigma in society than it should. And we're obviously all working on that. And, but that's a socialization thing, right? And so I would imagine with some of these things like isolation and anxiety, it might not be the easiest thing in the world to take time out of your day, walk down to the guidance office to somebody maybe you don't know and say, hey, I have a problem. I need to talk to somebody about it. Um, so if you could just talk about, about the, um, the opportunities that students have for that. I, I can answer that one, um, unless uh, Mr. Sadiq, you wanna, you want me to start? Yeah, you can start. Okay, I, I I think that it's really important to address stigma um, and how we help our students and our faculty feel more comfortable, not only being uncomfortable, but letting people know they need some help. Um, I, I think that our guidance counselors have done an incredible job, very similar to what Jamie um, described, um, making um, it much easier for students to make appointments, to be connected, whether it's through Hey, make an appointment from my from our virtual website, or we're going to have this scheduled appointment already um, in place. Um, small groups that we try to offer in classes to talk about things like that and give students access to staff members. Um, we certainly want to increase um, the visibility uh, for students that it is not only okay, but really important health and wellness wise and academically to be addressing these things and to get more familiar with your, um, with how you work. Um, last year, right before COVID, unfortunately, we were right in the swing of doing what I think was a really cool um, seven session um, group with a lot, with about 75 students uh, in a partnership with one of our tier two programs, just about the teenage brain. And it brought so many other, so many students to sort of our, to the guidance office and to other people saying, hey, like, I want to talk about this, or I have some concerns, or I didn't know that I could do something about sort of building my ability to be more organized. I thought that I just, this is who I was. So providing that psychoeducation, whether it's through advisory, which we're really excited to plan for, and we're already doing um, for next year, really doing that psycho ed, I think is step one in helping students be accountable and understand who they are and what's happening um, in their brains and in their bodies and in their relationships. Um, and then your first question, I, I'm so glad to know about that. And this is something that Mr. Sadiq and Ms. Zephyr and the guidance counselors and, and I and Dr. Brady, we're, we're sort of all really talking about um, some of, there's been some really cool partnerships with the Bright Network and DESE and um, a local foundation or a statewide foundation, I'm sure, Faye, you can talk about this a little bit more, but there are, there are some really exciting opportunities um, for integrating more of this mental health um, in, in tier one that we really wanna take advantage of. Yeah, thanks, Karen. 
summed it up very nicely. I honestly don't have too much more to add to it, but that, like I said, you summed it up very nicely. Thanks. Um, I think Karen did a brilliant job. So, so in 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 the uh, and not trying to make this too much longer. The only other piece that kind of came to mind as we're all talking is just, um, Mr. Demley, when you talk about you know the stigma. Um, you know, the the importance of the language from the district and from all of the adults and how we talk about kind of mental health and who accesses it. Um, and I have um, been really proud of the way that that our district has has done that, um, you know, even even in small ways when uh, you know, Mike is able to, when Mike puts in blurbs about kind of the amazing things Summit Academy is doing in the all student newsletters, or we talk about um, the the work that we're, we're doing at Summit, the really important work around kind of mental health and meeting kids where they're at and, um, and really trying to do away with, and I grew up in this community, you know, some stigma that still exists around, you know, who are students who access those most kind of, um, the the a place like Summit Academy or used to be the the South Amherst campus um, and and how we we can kind of promote Summit Academy within the community um, and and just talk about it and so it, it it also kind of starts at home with all of us and how we um, and how we do those pieces so it's an important piece. Mr. Stamel. Well, just I'm prolonging it a little, but so is Summit Academy in a separate building from the high school. And I'm wondering, can the kid, do the kids at Summit ever integrate with the high school? Yeah. And are there I, ways to make them feel, you know, truly apart? Yeah, I can actually do that one. So that's a good thing. Um, so I wanna say it was two or three years ago time, you know, there's like weird vortex of the last 14 months that messes up how we remember what happened beforehand. but. Um, Summit Academy used to be on uh, right off Southeast Street. Um, the building is still there. Um, and uh, several years ago, there were multiple factors that uh, contributed to moving the Summit Academy over. So it is now a distinct part. Uh, it's located at the high school, but has a distinct wing uh, in, in the high school building. And, you know, I think we could have a much longer conversation of how things have changed, you know, uh, and how it's impacted some you know, some students have enjoyed that and some students it's been a harder transition. Uh, I'm not trying to be Pollyanna-ish uh, about it, but one of the advantages is it does allow for more opportunities for integration uh, in the way that you cite. Um, you know, some of the reasons just so, so you know the history, Mr. Stammel, uh, you know, there was a retaining wall uh, that was having a problem at Summit that was gonna be hard to fix. There were a lot of facilities issues. Uh, and then there was a fiscal implication uh, of having its own campus. So. Uh, it was a lot of discussion, a lot of conversation. I really want to thank Dave, Jamie, and the staff because uh, they were critical in making that transition work. It's it's easy for someone like me to go up here, at, you know, a school committee meeting and say it'll work. Much more challenging for people who are on the ground to actually make it work. And uh, they did a tremendous amount of individual work. Some of it's done as a group, but some of it's about individuals. You know, kids who were excited to go got there were like, oh my God, this isn't this isn't doesn't sound great anymore. And then we had some of the reverse: kids who were anxious about it and actually really enjoyed the experience of being uh, in the same building as the high school. So right now it is in this, the building. It, it had a lot of facilities worked on and continues to need uh, some, some work that, uh, you know, around HVAC system because of how we changed the classrooms to accommodate that. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say on that one is in Mr. Sadiq and the high school staff also welcoming Summit was really critical um, because it's, it's one thing again to work out all those details. Another thing, how, how people feel. And even you can see it tonight in terms of Karen and Jamie that there is there are connections made, right? And there, you know, one of the advantages from the adult learning perspective is there are people teaching similar things or working on similar uh, aspects. And the fact that they're down the hall versus uh, across town can make a difference in terms of the professional culture as well. So, you know, long-winded answer to your question, but I think it's a really important one. And it's in the not so distant past of, of the school committee who had to weigh lots of factors in making that decision. I would just add one, th a couple things actually. The mic's right on. Um, you know, the notion of stigma anytime you have a public day school, and, it, and this school has been around for, believe it or not, more than 35 years. And, but it's changed in lots of different ways. It used to be an alternative school. And we're always uh, fighting the stigma of what does it mean to go to that school? So the question you're asking is really important because the students that represent Summit Academy 
are the best and the brightest. And I mean that in, uh, figuratively and literally, right? You know, because um, these kids are uh, doing incredible, uh, uh, we're gonna have graduation on Friday and they're going to four year colleges and they're going to the community and they're already in the community working. And sometimes all people think about in public day schools that they're, they're the, the problem student or the behavioral student. That is an absolute killer. And we still battle that, even with the adults in our community, even with teachers at the high school. And it's hard. And so I don't want to just, you know, sugarcoat that. That is something that the school committee, and they did it and continued to step up for Summit Academy. We had a great, and that, this is years ago, Michael, and some, some people remember this, but we had two of our students represent who they were. And that is the best you can ever do. And so I, I invite people when we can, and people have come to Summit Academy, uh, you know, and, and, and just to meet the students. They're just amazing. The art, art ability, the, the, the athletic ability, the academic ability matches everybody. And the thing that I love about our students the most is they're out there. They don't walk around with a veneer. They walk around just right there and it's something special. And so, so um, we're really proud of the students we have and we want and know the community is too, but that's something we're always gonna work with. And, and we have to work it with our students. We have to change their frame. What does it mean to be a Summit Academy student? And when they go to graduation every year, they see what it means. It means to be resilient. It means uh, to, in the face of real tough odds to keep moving forward. And, and, um, and they do, and they learn and they build these skills. And, and it's just, uh, it's wonderful that we as a community have kept a public day school because, you know, it's, it's one of our gems. And I, 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 you know, I just wanted, it's important. So thank you for the questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you for, um, for the uh, for the passion and, and leadership as well. Um, any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Um, so I really appreciate um, you all joining us tonight for this conversation. It was really helpful to sort of hear the frame of of, of the challenges that our students are facing and, and the supports that they're getting through all of your work and your colleagues. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Have a good night, thank folks. you for having us. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks. All right. um, so we'll move on to our next item, which is um, discussion of uh, consideration of a district indigenous lands acknowledgement. Um, and this agenda item was proposed by um, Ms. Lord. Um, and so I will turn it over to you, Ms. Lord, to introduce this topic. Okay, thank you. I want to thank Chair McDonald for being eager at the suggestion of a land acknowledgement and putting this discussion on the agenda. Part of what drives me in this comes from a quote by Dr. Shirley Whitaker in her movie, Ashes to Ashes. She's one of our own and her son graduated from our district, school district, a little while back. In the movie, Ashes to Ashes, she throws a memorial service for the victims of horrific murder by lynching most of whom were denied a funeral or service. In the movie, she also works with a survivor of a lynching attempt, Winfred Rembrandt. Wanted to bring his name up. Thank you, Winfred. Dr. Whitaker says that as a doctor, she needs to know the medical history in order to provide a treatment for healing. She likens that to this country. In this country, if we don't acknowledge our history, we're not ever gonna truly be healed. Um, the raw, ugly, hurtful truth so that we can heal and hope to create a country that isn't still replicating much of the harm in a different way. I'm grateful this district voted to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day a few years back as opposed to Columbus Day. I'm grateful to the school committees that have banned or are fighting to ban Indian mascots. In the 1600s, the decapitated head of an Indian earned someone 30 shillings. So when I see some of the mascots, especially a head, it's traumatic and painful reminder of that violent past. A land acknowledgement is but a first step. If we stop there, the action becomes performative and harmful. In full transparency, I would like 
a land acknowledgement to be a step in a multi-year journey that may involve looking into the curriculum we use to teach the indigenous past and present um, to prevent erasure and misrepresentation. What books do we have available? Are they deficit-based and only told from the side of the conqueror? We have amazing librarians, so I know that's not the case, but um, what more books could we add? Um, how do we connect with local elders and members of the indigenous community? Um, we have a restorative justice practice that uses circle practice, and that has been an indigenous practice for thousands of years. Are we honoring that and connecting with local elders around that? Um, how do we support our students who are indigenous? Last year at graduation, a mother spoke to me about the heritage shoals, stoles some of the students wear, and she asked, why didn't we have an indigenous one? Where's the space for us to um, have someone get a stole of their tribal colors? Are, and are we even having these discussions? So that's what, like the land acknowledgement to me is the first step in a very important step towards us embracing our anti-racist, our multicultural um, truth that we're living in. If we decide to go further, I have tons of resources that I can condense and share with everyone. And um, yes, if you have any questions or any thoughts, I think, is that what we do next? I'll actually, I'll throw it back to Chair McDonald because she knows the deal. You, you were doing, you were doing really well. You, you that was, <laughs> that's all I would say is, uh, um, uh, thank you for that, that, um, helpful introduction. Um, and as, as Ms. Lord acknowledged, um, when she first proposed this, um, we, we talked about it just to educate myself about sort of where, you know, what other districts are doing and, and, um, what this, what this could look like for our district. So, um, I've, I've, I've learned a lot in probably the last couple of months when you first proposed this topic. Um, I think that the discussion, so we're not trying to move to any sort of decision right now. I think it's really to understand sort of what the temperature is from the from the committee about wanting to explore um, a land acknowledgement as well as um, as Ms. Lord described some of the other um, other ideas. Uh, you, you, you had your hand up. Ms. I'm Lord. sorry, I didn't give the basic. A land acknowledgement is where we take a moment to say, this land belonged to these tribes that were here first, just in case. We're throwing around that word and I realized I didn't stop and just say, we are acknowledging we're on stolen land and here's who it belonged to before it was taken. Mr. Stamel. Any particular land? Is it the country we're talking about? Is it the, the, our, our, our general area, Amherst? Um, where the school is. I was envisioning our district. I know it's Nipmunk and a couple of other tribes that were here first, um, but. Mr. Demling. So I really appreciate this being on the agenda because I had never heard of the concept before it was on our agenda. Um, and I, I really like the, I so, I still very much novicely learning of the basics of it. Um, I really like the idea, though. Of, I like how how localized it is. That um, that in in talking about and because we're the Amherst Pond Regional School Committee, we're not you know the state of Massachusetts or or anything greater than that, right? And so you know, so we have our own um, zone of zone of focus and to understand and learn what who those tribes. I mean, you just mentioned the names, but I had never heard that before. Um, so that that's that would be a really great educational learning opportunity, I think, um, for our students, uh, for for our community. Um, I can certainly imagine engaging students with this. This would be a great uh, opportunity, I think, for school committee collaboration with with uh, student. So I'm sure I'm I'm sure there must be some teachers that are passionate about this topic as well, um, who could who could um, maybe tie in some projects or or, or some community groups, but. Um, and and I'm I'm glad we're not voting on something today because I I think Miss Lord mentioned you know this shouldn't just be performative like oh here's some statement that we blow by and just all say yay it's that it's it's a means to, towards an end of of building awareness um, and uh, you know I mean just generally speaking it is uncomfortable to be um, you know living in a a space that 
originally isn't ours, or at least, at least it's not mine, right? Um, and, and, and struggling with that and, and coming to terms with that. So I, I definitely am into um, having this be the first step and, and, um, and uh, putting some more effort into it. Mr. Scammell. Yeah, I mean, I love, I'm very supportive of the whole idea. I would, um, you know, in discussing this, Personally, I would stay away from words like stolen land, which might be totally true. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not true, but if we were to support this, I think, I mean, I would most likely favor language that was, hmm, I'm not sure how to say it. I don't want to say neutral because it's not a neutral topic, but I don't think it's a good thing to, to politicize in any way. I think it's a good thing to make a statement about it in a way that shows that we recognize and are appreciative of the people who were here and whose land we're on. But I, I'm uncomfortable with the word stolen. When um, I did uh was poking around and looking at sort of what other districts and other regions have done. I, this is actually something that's really, um, I don't know if it's legislated, in, like required in Canada, but across Canada, um, schools um, are, and it, I don't know that it's every single school day, but sort of like for some of us older folks here, when we were required to say the Pledge of Allegiance at the big start of school every day, it's it's the equivalent um, and and more and there's lots and lots of examples of different um, phrasings and 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 wording depending on um, the location and relationship and one of the things um, I think it might be useful to share some of the information there's um, lots just fr from within Canada but also um, from from U.S. organizations that have. Um, have guides for how to approach this. And I think as Ms. Lord described, you know, the key is connecting with elders in, in the region or area um, to define and, and collaborate together on defining what that acknowledgement could look like and sound like. Um, again, not sort of, to not be the group that sort of decides how we're going to acknowledge something um, that isn't ours or wasn't ours. And Ms. Lord, you have your, I do. I just wanted to speak for a moment to the discomfort in certain words. And I, I didn't use the word genocide because that makes a lot of people comfortable, but that's what happened. And so I know we might struggle with calling it a stolen land or, or genocide, but these are truths and these are realities. And um, how can we be like not, how can we sit in that discomfort and help us grow into um a loving peace and a healing around that. Um, whew, sorry, it's overwhelming, but every year I do the year, day of mourning where the indigenous, a lot of indigenous come together and they tell their stories and there's still so much pain and discomfort in the indigenous community that I can't make myself comfortable by wrapping it in words that sound nicer or like, hey, we borrowed your land. So I, I understand what you're saying, and it will turn a lot of people off to use words like stolen or genocide, but um, I have to honor the pain, the history, and the truth, and then the healing that can come from just being raw. So I just, I wanted to acknowledge that I heard what you said, but I also need to push back a little about my use of words and why I go there. Thank you. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I kind of wanted to double down on that because I, I feel like if we're doing this genuinely, we need to represent what genuinely happened, right? Like we need to use words like forced removal from land, these sorts of things, stolen land, et cetera, et cetera, because that's what it is. We also need to figure out ways. To, so we're, we're an educational body here, right? We also need to tie in those sorts of things because these people, they had concepts of education in, in, in these sorts of things. Like we actually need to represent who it was like specifically that was here and pardon me for like actually literally reaching for a voice right now but i'm kind of under the weather there i don't i have a lot more to say about the topic i just don't have the wind to do it right now miss dancer 
Um, I would just like to say that I support this. I support the language. Um, and I would be very interested. You said that there are resources. And I personally would be interested in knowing about some of those things. Ms. Fitzer. I'd also just like to state my support for us moving forward with this and um, especially bringing in folks with um, connections to the native peoples who were here before and students or other outsiders outside of our committee who might have, um, I guess the best word would be stakeholders, people who, who are connected to this issue more directly. Thank you, um, Ms. Lord, for bringing it to the committee. I'm, I'm here in general um, assent to to moving forward with this from, from the committee. So I'm just going to pause to see if there's any objections. Thumbs up, please. Um, so I'm wondering if a, a next step might be if there's somebody who would like to partner with Ms. Lord in, um, in sort of coming up with and developing that process um, for how we how we will move forward and sort of develop that um, some ideas that then the committee can consider at a future meeting. Does that sound good? Ms. Dancer. Oh, you volunteer to? Uh, I, yes, I do. I volunteer. Great. So um, I think some next steps is um, we'll share some, some resources for the full committee to, to get build our understanding of this and Ms. Stanzer and Ms. Lord will take this um, and work together on coming back to us with a proposal or ideas. <laughs> Great. Any further um, comment? Okay. okay. So we will um, move on uh, to the next item, which is uh, an update. Oh, sorry. Uh, skip one discussion on um, the funding support that we that the district receives from our town colleges and universities um, and I think this is we'll start with just um, understanding sort of what we currently receive um, from the various institutions and I think uh, Dr. Morris you prepared something yep so um, in terms of the current funding that we receive uh, for the more years than I've been in this role. So more than five, we received $75,000 uh, from Amherst College. Um, that typically is went to support uh, some work in the family center and uh, is primarily used at the regional level. Uh, the other uh, major institution in town, UMass, uh, last year, the year before, again, years get a little funny, uh, had not historically had a funding stream that went directly to the schools. However, in support, uh, and I want to thank the town for supporting this as well. Um, it was 100, it gets a little complicated, but at the current time, it's $185,000. Uh, what gets a little complicated is only 15,000 of that comes to the regional schools. The rest goes to the Amherst Public Schools, and that's based on the number of students who uh, attend our districts who live in off-campus housing. Um, and that is skewed much more heavily at the elementary level in Amherst than it is at the regional level. And I think the additional wrinkle is right now the place where off-campus students live, um, excuse me, uh, yeah, no, where, where, where UMass students live uh, in, in UMass uh, supported houses, which is uh, not taxed, no longer exists right now. No one lives there. So this is Puffton, I think, I think that's the right name, um, or North, I'm going to mess it up. Sorry. It's one of those days where the words aren't with me, but Carrie or Peter will remember, I'm sure. They're nodding their, they're nodding their heads that they will. But in any case, the place, because there's actually more than one, it's just primarily in, I think it's North Village. Um, the place where UMass students live in tax-exempt housing uh, is getting rebuilt. And I want to publicly state I appreciate that that funding stream is continuing despite the fact that there are no students right now or very few students living uh, in tax exempt housing with children who attend the Amherst Public Schools um, because that's a two year project, but they committed for three years. 
And this is the second year, and so we appreciate their support. That's not to detract from the larger conversation that the committee has, but that is the current situation. To summarize, I'll do much more succinctly. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, is that we received $75,000 from Amherst College, and that goes directly to the region. And the regional school district receives $15,000 as part of a larger sum that comes uh, from UMass that is uh, making, uh, acknowledging the tax exempt housing where we have students uh, living, but no taxes coming into the town. So I think that's a summary you wanted to give. Sorry, that was a little circular way of describing it, but that's, that's our current status. Mr. Samuel. It's a 75,000 per year, or was that a one-time thing? It is, uh, it is yearly. We do ask for it. it. It's not in perpetuity. It's not a forever commitment, but it has uh, worked that way, and we have a commitment for the next two years uh, for that to remain um, in place. And, and for UMass, it was a three-year commitment made a year and a half ago. So again, that'll potentially have to be renegotiated um, and that gets a little, you know, I want to, I think it's worth talking about the complexity. It gets a little more complicated because when North Village is redone, it presumably is larger and it was done based on a formula, uh, a tax exempt housing that will need to be reassessed as the North Village comes, the new North Village comes online, I think it's in 2022. Could be wrong on that, but I believe that's the year it's supposed to come online. Ms. Stancer? Um, Dr. Morris, so I'm not sure I quite understand about the 185,000 from UMass. You said about 15,000 goes to the regional schools, and so that would leave what 170,000, and that goes directly to the elementary schools in Amherst, or it goes to the town. I don't quite understand that. Sure. So the mechanics are that it goes to the town, and then that directly goes to the schools. Um, so it is, it, there is one step in the way, but the town of Amherst has committed to having those, since it's related directly to school funding for that fund, those funds to be directly applied to the schools. Sorry, I should have been more clear about that. Mr. Dumley. Yeah, um, just, so just to put a finer point on what Dr. Morris said, it subsidizes the town of Amherst support for Amherst public schools. It's not, we don't get the town of Amherst like say town of Amherst says 3% for service departments. We don't get 3% plus 170 K at the elementary level. It, it reduces the amount of, of support that the town of Amherst pays to, to run the public schools, which <laughs> for the school committee is an important point, but we're talking about the elementary, but, um, Mr. Demling. Yeah, so separate point. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, so I asked for this to be on the agenda, so I appreciate it. Um, I really just wanted to broach the topic because I feel like it's an important but um, awkward conversation to begin because what we're talking about is currently is voluntary contributions from our uh, from the u colleges and universities in our community, right? And and um, and there is active discussion across the state right now about whether or not these organizations that have some of whom have many millions of dollars of tax exempt property um, shouldn't be paying. It, it, there's an open question discussion about should they be paying more to their towns um, and should they be required to pay more to their towns. And there's some bills currently being um, uh, advocated for at the state level that would that would give municipalities the ability to require colleges and universities to um, to pay more than than what they currently do. It's called uh, so right so right now the, the there are different um, agreements between universities and local towns across the state, Harvard and Williams and whatnot, uh, and they're generally referred to as pilot payment in lieu of taxes, which is a fancy way of saying that a voluntary informal agreement has been reached between um, the municipality or school district and, and the college or university. Um, and uh, just from some groups that I've attended recently on the topic, um, the, the amounts that these pilot agreements are vary quite a bit. Um, and they're not always um, followed through on, about two thirds of the time they're, they're not, or, or rather I, about a third of the time they're not. Meaning if you look at say a pilot agreement that 
X, X school is supposed to pay $100,000 a year, it's, it's, it works out to about two thirds of that because it's, there, there's an enforcement mechanism. Um, so this was really about, um, you know, is, is there an opportunity to maybe rekindle some of these discussions with our local universities? And it's interesting because I think the schools that we're talking about are in much different positions. You know, so we have um, Hampshire College, um, which is we haven't mentioned yet, um, but we probably all know they were on the brink of going out of existence very recently. <laughs> um, so they, they've had very, very difficult financial situations. And they're a much smaller school um, than the, the other two we're talking about. UMass is, is of course, larger and, and we have the agreement, um, but it's it's a very limited definition, right, based on off-campus housing um, and does not um, take into account the other benefits. There's a lot of benefits from uh, to the university gets from being an Amherst that they go far beyond um, off-campus housing that they get they get from the public schools, right? If you want, it's a the excellence of the Amherst public schools is a big um, a big attractor to 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 an employer, um, and UMass is the biggest employer. And then Amherst College, you know, is um, I think a focal point because um, they they have uh, a very um, large amount of resources to put it to put it bluntly um uh you know they have a, a large endowment and, and when you compare them to a school like williams um that has a similar level endowment uh, williams has historically and i think very publicly in recent years supported their public schools because they've they've talked about how it's part of their mission to support excellence in public schools and and, and the benefits they get from public schools they, they, they've contributed literally millions of dollars to renovations of high schools and elementary schools and and they pay, I think it's about 200k a year um, to to um, to their local community. So um, I just thought, as we emerge from this pandemic, um, and you know, we have uh, certainly a number of major capital things on the horizon that our region would love to get to track and whatnot. Um, but it, it might be an opportunity to to go back to to Amherst College and revisit and say, you know, is is 75,000 the right amount or is there an opportunity here to talk about what Amherst College values and what regional schools provide and is there something you know that that we can is there an update that is appropriate so that was that was the reason for prompting the discussion Miss Kenny sorry um can I ask a quick question about Amherst College is Amherst College that funding handled the same way as the UMass funding, so like it supplements what the town pays. So I, it's a hard. I mean, it all supplements does it, does it the it town pays. The so same way? It, it goes directly to the district. There's no intermediary, so that would be a dis, a difference. Um, so, so if. Amherst says, you know, we need this many dollars for level funding. Therefore, it's the what was it like three, three percent, two percent, something like that. That it's the two percent in addition, or that seventy-five thousand is included in that two percent. So at the current time, that's part of our operational budget, you know, because we've counted on it. So um, I mean, I suppose it's a philosophical, right? It, question because we do it pays things it pays for things every year that um if all of a sudden amherst college was to say no we're not doing the seventy five thousand dollars we would have to realize a reduction in that uh in what it's paying for in the family center and that money would have to come from somewhere so i don't think it, it applies as much in terms of what the towns are giving us it is it does supplement whatever because the regional level whatever the increase is but we we it's part of our operating budget at this point because it's been so durable for six or seven years Okay, but it's not included as like what the town like it sounds maybe I'm misunderstanding. It sounds like the money from UMass is included as the money in within that money from Amherst. But Amherst College is not included the same way. Amherst College comes straight to the region and that's it. It's separate money. So let me say it differently. So I, I think, you know, Peter, you can correct me if I'm misstating. Um, what you shared, but so in terms of the funds that come from UMass, the $15,000, that um, 
benefits the district, it doesn't necessarily lower the assessment for the town of Amherst. It's not, you know, it's it's not like, oh, that just lowers the assessment for Amherst and everyone else has to pay more as a result. It goes, there, there's not that additional step. It just, it goes to the town and then we would essentially get a check in this case for $15,000 from the town of Amherst to support the regional budget, not to support the Amherst portion of the regional budget. Okay. Thank Does that you. help? Yeah. It's not, I'm not, I'm not having a great night talking. So luckily it's all right. mostly about you all. Something, so, yeah. something is there. I'm not either. It's, it's all good. <laughs> so can I just reframe that? So that, that money would show up not in when we review budgets um, or when the public is looking at our budgets that wouldn't show up in the appropriations or the appropriated budget that shows up as as other revenue. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. Um, so I want to start off by acknowledging how much um, the town gets from having the university and colleges located here. So I don't want because I'm worried that my comments are going to come off as, as being against the university or against uh, Amherst or, or Hampshire. Um, and so it's, it's none of those things. I think, um, th so there are two things I want to say. One is I, I'm frustrated with the, um, I think this is all rooted in the fact that the way our public schools are funded in the United States is through property taxation. And so when you have these large nonprofit public institutions, it could be a hospital, it could be a, you know, a, a university in our case, it takes a lot of land off of the property tax rolls for, for our districts. So as we're facing more acute budgets, this is becoming a, a bigger issue. And I think it's worth addressing. I'm, I, I, I know we get a lot, you know, from the universities in terms of, you know, things that we can't, you know, can't, can't count. Um, but I do think that we do provide um, also on, you know, less tangible benefits to, to the schools. And for example, you know, we have students from the university who come into our schools and, and receive some of their training in our schools. Um, correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, but, um, so I think it's the right thing to talk about. I guess my concern is I don't think we have much leverage. <laughs> you know, uh, we 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 don't have. Um, you know, I would be welcome to accept whatever funds um, the, the university or in the Amherst College would be willing to accept. But I I want to point out Amherst College recently one of the students and you know published an op-ed putting pressure on the college to consider increasing the amount of support that they give to the local community. And I think it, in, in the ways that we can support those types of efforts, I'm all for it. Um, I think if there are town councilors who want to get involved or state reps or any other um, kind of other stakeholders in the community who want to also work together, because I don't think it can just come from the school committee. I think we need to, and Peter, you know, it sounds like you're doing this, getting involved, and I'd be happy to, you know, work on efforts going forward to do this. I just don't know. Um, I think we could provide information to these efforts. I think we could provide um, amplification of their message as well. Like, I think it's interesting. I don't know if anybody heard from the Amherst College students who wrote, but I'm, you know, in this in the district. But it's interesting that this kind of popped up in in in, in the in the college newspaper. Um, the other thing that I'm going to point out, which is kind of getting into the weeds, is that I, I'm I have a lot of concerns about the way that the UMass um, is calculating how much and I know this was something that was decided long before and we engaged with the Donahue Institute for this report and was something I think that the um, other members of town government were working on from Amherst but it seems to me like it shouldn't be about how many students you have in the district it should be more about the amount of land that you're essentially taking offline from increasing our town's revenue and um, you know, Amherst College doesn't have a lot of their, you know, students have, I'd be surprised if it's more than, you know, just a handful of students from Amherst College who might have students within our district. And so if we use that kind of logic and apply it across the board, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I would be in favor of thinking about ways we can um, partner with others to increase the, the amount of money that our towns get from these institutions. But I'd also want to, you know, consider trying to move away from this idea that you only need to contribute to the town if you actually have 
students with students in the district, if that makes sense. So thank you. And that's, those are my thoughts. I think I'll, um, I'll just add to that. Um, I share that that the same concern as Ms. Spitzer about sort of philosophically, it's it's about sort of be, being a member of the community as opposed to paying for services that the schools are providing. Um, and you know, much as we benefit as a school district in a town from the presence of the colleges and university in the town, so do those colleges and university benefit from us from the town having a, a quality, a high quality um, and attractive public school system, right? So their ability to attract faculty and staff um, that are top notch um, is, is dependent and related to the quality of our public schools. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a co, we, we both, both groups um, benefit from the presence of the other and in that sort of collaborative spirit of sort of what's best for our overall community is sort of how I would approach the, the conversation. And I agree, we're, how much leverage do we have? This is not a new conversation. Um, and so things haven't changed other than the legislation at the state level. And I feel like that's, in my mind, that's probably our strongest option or approach is to, is to partner with our representatives um, in the state house and the Senate to um, progress that legislation um, in, in that avenue. But Mr. Emily? Yeah, so I mean, these are really good points. Um, you know, the, the point of leverage is, is, is an interesting one and it, it, it is the, the fulcrum of why this is awkward, right? Because if, if, the, if some of the bills that are currently in the works became law, then, then it, would, it wouldn't be a, a choice, right? You wouldn't, you'd have the leverage of law and you could do whatever you like. Um, so, I, so while I think that that is worthy of pursuit, um, I think the other opportunity here, you know, to, to try and be as fair as possible to, to Amherst College, right? Who's currently giving us 75,000 without having to is, is um, you know, it's like, we don't, we don't currently know how they're feeling about this right now. And it's and be, you know give, because they've already given us money, it's of course not a new conversation, but I would call it a dormant conversation. It's it's certainly never come up on since I've been on the committee. Um, and um, you know, they're busy; <laughs> they have things to attend to, and 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 management and people change, and 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 so this it I'm uh, the idea of a discussion isn't so much to you know let's have some Machiavellian high political pressure campaign to force their hand it's more hey let's 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 open the door to an opportunity right to have a conversation and say hey amherst college you, you obviously benefit from being in the town we benefit from having you here um you obviously have a very publicly stated mission about equity and we have a public school that services a lot of high need students um you know we're a big draw for your for staff is is this something that you know you want want to engage and just and just give them the the opportunity just to have that conversation um you know and i'm, I'm also you know a, want to be sensitive to that even though amherst college clearly has a large endowment um it's the devil is always in the details of these things right and it's i, I don't want to make this so simplistic that like oh they're rich therefore we should use their endowment as a checkbook to fund our public schools that's not like <laughs> where i'm going with this it's more it's more when you compare to other pilot agreements williams and, and some other places out out west um, you know, we're, we're quite the outlier in terms of the level of support. And so it's, it's an opportunity to just kind of explore that, I think. Ms. Spitzer, did you have a hand up again? Just a quick follow-up question. Um, when you brought in the example of Williams, you mentioned that they had funded specific capital projects in part. Is that, so the, to me, a pilot is sort of, um, I'm thinking of um, a steady amount, but I'm wondering if maybe just thinking out with strategy, <laughs> with with potentially would would capital projects be something that you'd envision looking to our community partners for support in a way that hasn't been done in the past? I'm thinking of fields or other types of large ticket items. Mr. Demley. 
I mean, yeah, <laughs> I think I think it's all on the table, right? So, um, so the Williams they they um, they helped rent or over uh, they contributed over a million dollars. Um, or actually, it was it was five million. I'm sorry, five million to help mo renovate Mount Greylock, and then one point one million to uh, to help renovate a, an elementary school. And then in addition to those one-time capital expenses, they contribute about two hundred thousand a year in operational. In, in like the, the pilot. Um, so so that's just one example from the other pilot agreements that I've looked at there. They run the gamut of variations of that. Um, and, you know, you bring up an, a great point. You know, our region obviously has a very urgent need for uh, the track and the fields uh, investment that's going to be very difficult to do for given the capital demands of our member towns, particularly particularly Amherst um, and what, what they're trying to do in the next five years. So, um, so yeah, I think I think all that's on on part of the conversation, right? I think that's um, and and who knows how far either one of those threads would get, but um, you know, we would won't know what's possible unless we unless we look for it, I guess. Any other thoughts, comments? Do we do we have a, a next step coming out of this discussion? Hearing, I've heard lots of lots of support for the idea of of um, pursuing the support for and advocating for uh, that pilot legislation, which I will note, I believe that exempts public institutions, tax exempt institutions, so that would not impact UMass. Um, as, as I recall the reading of that. So it's private institutions over a certain amount of loss of exempt property tax. Um, any other sort of ideas on next step? Do we want to come back to this at a future conversation, Mr. Demley? I, I the, just the general next step I thought of was either Dr. Morris or Chair McDonald or some other individuals that I'm not thinking of might be more appropriate. Um, just reaching out to Amherst College, to our, our points of contact over there, uh, who who set this 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 gift up uh, that they currently have to our region. Um, and just, you know, seeing if they're open to having a conversation, I guess. Um, I'm not, I don't really have any well formulated plan beyond beyond that. Um, but I'm, you know, certainly interested to hear what Dr. Morris has to say. And... Dr. Morris? Yeah, I think, you know, I'd appreciate it. I'm happy to be part of that conversation. I think given that they've communicated with Dr. Slaughter and I and myself already on their existing gift, I think it'd be helpful if the school committee, not Mr. Demling in particular, or chair, however it works out, but took the lead on it. I'm happy to be part of those conversations, but I just, I'm a little concerned about the optics of me accepting a gift and then, um, seeming like I don't want to accept a gift. And that was done without school committee, right? That wasn't, uh, you know, I think I think school committee is really clean on that. That's not something that we, you know, talked about openly or that there was a school committee vote on. But um, uh, again, I'm happy to be part of any conversation, but I think if the communication came from the committee, I think it, it would feel more comfortable to me. I think it has a better chance of being successful. So I'm happy to do that if the committee wishes that I do that. Seeing smiles and nods, so <laughs> I will, I will move forward, and I'll connect with you, Dr. Morris, on on sort of next step. Ms. Spitzer, did you have another comment? I was just curious because we always read out loud gifts, and I, I think we're talking about this as a gift, but it must not be structured as a gift. Otherwise, we'd probably be reading at the end of the a meeting an acceptance of. So, is it structured as a grant? Is it structured as? So let me, I'm just uh, curious to be, because we're talking about it as a gift, but it, yep. we, went, we, we read most of our gifts. Yeah, so I will have Dr. Slaughter respond to you about how that's coded. Um, and he can send an email later this week. Great question. Okay, if there's no other um, comments or thoughts on that, then we'll move on. Great. Um, 
So next up, we have a um, updates and discussion um, from our member towns. Um, if, if there's any updates on plans regarding sixth grade um, to the middle school. So Ms. Stancer. Um, I can just say that at the last Pelham School Committee, we did um, decide to open the door to talk about it. That it was felt that it would be appropriate to have the discussion. And I'll just um, share that the Amherst School Committee um, also is doing that. And there's, um, a, a, um, I believe, Mr. Harrington and Ms. Spitzer were working on an engagement plan that the Amherst School Committee will hear at our next meeting next week. So that's the quick update from Amherst. Mr. Stanley? The non-update from Leverett is that we've had three regional meetings and we before we're having our next meeting which is next monday so we still have not met uh and we'll be having that's on the agenda for monday mr sullivan oh sure so there's no no change in shootsbury that shootsbury will be holding on to its students but we are very happy to open the door up or kick it open or whatever it is for anyone else that would like to put their sixth graders in there. Great. Fill that space up. Mr. Stamel. So this is for Steve in there. Uh, so does that mean that the, the school committee in Shootsbury has, has decided or voted to keep their sixth graders? I mean, is that a firm decision you've already made? Just curious. Well, it it's, uh, you know, this is my seventh year on this committee so that I've been Part of the discussion every time that it comes up and yeah it hasn't changed that we've never taken a vote one way or the other it's always just been understood that at this point we wouldn't even consider it okay. any other comments mr demling dr morris in terms of like engagement process do you feel like now that we've had this update, is is the next kind of bus driver the elementary districts? In other words, is our, is our work here done for the moment in terms of this, or or in terms of public engagement, is this going to be like we've already decided? Okay, the door's open if if y'all want to explore it and it's logistically feasible and whatnot. So at, at the region level, are we kind of on pause until the the feeding elementary districts get back? I'm just trying to organize my brain in terms of do I think of this as a regional or elementary topic in the coming months? Yeah, um, so I think, um, can't give you a binary answer on that, um, so I apologize. I think the reality is that uh, until an elementary district comes with a, a real plan of engagement, um, they may want to partner with you. It may be an opportunity to have perhaps even a joint, you know, there are going to be some joint meetings for other reasons this spring, and I think that may make sense. Um, I think I think you're right. I think that at this point, the elementary, to use your uh, metaphor, the elementary districts are, are driving the bus, but I wouldn't say the region's not on. They're just, you know, a couple seats back watching, uh, seeing what's happening. They're like the bus monitor. Um, because at the end of the day, the reality is, you know, the elementary districts could want to and the terms might not be suitable at the regional level. So. Um, I think at this point, you know, I think the continued engagement, like updates like this are going to be really important. Um, and perhaps at one of those joint meetings, if we're mapping out engagement, uh, which I think, I think we will, um, I think the likelihood that we will is high. Uh, I think that's where the region needs to sort of get back involved. But I think at this point, it's more on the observer offering feedback from a, from a regional level, uh, because we're, it's not entirely clear yet that we have a, an elementary district that is, desiring to send it, being open and, and wanting to do it are two really different things. And I think there's some point in between those two things of like, yeah, we're interested and yeah, we want to do it where I think the region needs to weigh in. But I think we're not quite there in terms of what I've heard from the elementary districts. We may be there by the end of the month uh, of wanting to plan some some joint engagement, but I don't, I don't think that we're there quite yet. Mr. Stamel. I'm pretty sure this question is real premature, but um, you know, just, trying to figure out what a discussion might look like in Leverett at our school committee. Uh, so 
if 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 x number of towns if if, if ta some towns chose to send their sixth graders to middle school and leverett and shootsbury or some other towns didn't um at at some point would there be some kind of curriculum alignment would there be some kind of uh, coordination between or among sixth grade teachers you know at the middle school and at individual schools i mean that's that's one issue in my mind. Dr. Morris? Uh, so we currently struggle with that. Uh, and I think one of the advantages perhaps of having sixth grade in the middle school, although I'm not going down a road of saying we should do it, is that there'd be more opportunities to align the curriculum um, and not just between our member towns, but you know, between the three schools in Amherst even, uh, there are some challenges uh, with that. So. You know, I think as I think I maybe I mentioned last time, um, Superintendent Colkeen has a lot of experience with this more than me, frankly, uh, in her work in Union 28, because she does one of our other elementary districts in Union 28 sends students to a sixth through eight middle school, but sends them at seventh grade. So I think that'd be a great conversation to have at the Leverett School Committee. I'm certainly happy to participate in whatever makes sense. But uh, I learned a lot talking to her about how they've uh, made that work well, and it wasn't really working. I want to speak for her, but how they've improved the situation from when she came in and they've made some very intentional decisions around what it means as a seventh grader to enter a sixth through eight middle school uh, in seventh grade. So we're very, in my opinion, we're very fortunate to have her in general because I like her a lot, but also we're very fortunate to have her experience because this exact phenomenon currently exists in Union 28. So I think it'd be a great thing to bring up in Leverett. Again, I'm happy to attend any meeting or you know, to uh, connect with her offline like I typically do on that topic. Mr. Sullivan? Yeah, so Gene, I was wrong about one thing. We have discussed one piece of this and it comes up every single time and everybody in town who knows about it, it they ask about how does the assessment change if somebody did put their sixth grade in the school? Dr. Marks? Yep, so there's two ways to think about it, and I'm not proffering a, uh, advice or feedback on them. One of them is to change the regional agreement, which would have a direct impact on assessment methods and, and things like that, and assessments. The other way is a rental agreement, uh, where town or towns who want to have their sixth graders in um, provide a financial support to the region for rental of space and uh, access to staff members that would cut across a sixth or eight middle school, such as a nurse, um, custodial staff, you know, I mean, there, there's some question marks in there, but it's clear that custodial staff and nurses and uh, would, would be cutting across those. So I think there's different ways to do it. And again, that's where the region would want to jump in with some of its thoughts about how to do that. I think, you know, that's probably as far as I should go now until we know more of who's seriously considering it. But hopefully that's helpful in just giving some context, Mr. Sullivan, of different ways it could be addressed financially. Okay. Um, so when we come back to future agenda planning, we can talk about sort of our, our next steps in, in this, this ongoing discussion. Any more thoughts or questions? Seeing none, um, we'll move on to our next topic, which is um, a discussion. Um, we talked about wanting to talk, uh, look at our subcommittee structure and um, and our policies, um, any, any conversation about our subcommittees actually needs to refer back to, um, to looking at our policies and, and what, do, what did we commit ourselves to doing with regard to um, subcommittees. I'm going to share my screen because I don't think that this, this sort of compilation showed up in the packet, um, uh, the public packet, so for folks watching at home. Um, just to be clear again, this is a discussion. We're not looking for um, a decision on anything um, other than a decision on where we want to go as as next steps coming out of this. Um, okay, so can you see my my screen? Um, so what I wanted to what I want to start with is just looking at what our current policy is and and sort of how that compares to sort of um, 
not just a model policy, but also surrounding districts, because ours is a little bit different. Um, and then look at our current subcommittees and appointments and, and structure, and then just have a discussion. And I, I shared some idea starters or thought starters for that discussion and when we get there, and then just finish with where we want to go from there. Now I have to, I lost my cursor. There we go. Okay. So um, this, uh, this links to our online policy. So for folks watching at home, if you want to um, click into that, it's on our um, school committee website under the policy and it's um, if you search for BDE you'll find it but this is a, just a quick summary um, the school committee may create subcommittees as needed um, so we we decide what um, which subcommittees we want um, the members are appointed by the chair of the committee and the members can may include residents staff and students as desired um, again that's up to the school committee and the and as appointed by the chair um, the school committee provides the subcommittee its charge, its function, and its duties. Um, subcommittees make recommendations to the school committee, but they don't act on behalf or for the school committee. The school committee may decide at any time um, to dissolve a subcommittee or to um, reappoint it. And um, as our subcommittee members all know, open meeting law applies to all subcommittees. Um, what I put in the in that in that packet was just a link to the model policy because if you look around um, and I looked at also at other districts um, around, across the state um, just poking them there's there's some key differences in our strat in our policy versus others um, and it's not not a value judgment just sort of calling out where there are differences so one of the key things is that most other policies have a time limit um, their annual appointments, and it doesn't mean that members don't serve longer than one year, but just that that it is a discussion every every year. Um, we were in the practice of doing that, even though our policy doesn't actually stipulate that. So I will say that we were in the practice of doing that. Um, we the other habit is that if we have standing subcommittees, that those are actually listed within the policy, um, that there aren't. Um, uh, standing policy, uh, standing subcommittees that aren't described um, within within policy and with their specific functions and duties. Um, in the most cases, it does it specifically calls out not including task forces or advisory committees, and some actually specify this, but it's implied um, in most other policies that a subcommittee is su school committee members. Um, and not sort of non-school committee members. Um, and I mentioned that because then it, that's, that's why they call out that it doesn't include task forces, advisory committees. Advisory committees is where it, um, in that model policy and in a, most other districts in the state, an advisory committee is where it's um, designed intend to, intentionally to be include members other than school committee members. So whether that's staff, students, community members, um, residents, parents, et cetera. Um, and those also are typically annual appointments. Appointments. Slight difference between an advisory committee and a subcommittee is that speci the specific tasks are assigned by the school committee and also with, um, with designation, sort of when, when an advisory committee is established of when is the reporting schedule to the school committee. Um, and also makes very clear that there's no standing overall advisory committee. Um, so you there you can't create an advisory committee just in general to advise the school committee. Um, an example um, is, and it, it specifies also that sort of advisory committees are that are required by law follow those policies and, and stipulations of that law. So an example would be the um, CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, or what we call the Bilingual Parent Advisory Council um, is also sort of stipulated by law. Um, and those, as you, as you might be familiar, those do have annual report requirements to the school committee. Um, so, um, any questions on, on just policy right now? I'm 
not seeing any, so I'll move on. So just looking at our current um, structure, um, and I pulled this from an old spreadsheet and updated, so I apologize if I said so if you if you see your name on one and you're not on the committee or you don't see your name and you and you are on the committee, please um, let me know so that we can get this actually accurate and representing our current thing. But we have um, a budget subcommittee, a policy subcommittee, superintendent evaluation, audit. Um, we refer to our contract negotiating as a subcommittee or three subcommittees and then school equity task force. These, this is sort of currently what's in our old spreadsheet for what the charge or description is for each subcommittee and our current membership. Um, the, and just to be clear, even though this is on one row, these are three separate groups. They're not, there isn't just one contract negotiating subcommittee. Um, one of the things that I also noticed is that for some of these roles that we call subcommittees, other districts don't refer to them as subcommittees. So um, if you look around um, and poke around in sort of other school districts, there's a budget, a policy, and then a, an evaluation committee that is actually sort of um, also includes um, working on setting goals um, as well as sort of spearheading the the actual annual evaluation so sort of full circle setting setting working to propose the goals as well as the um, evaluation um, contract negotiation is an appointment as opposed to a subcommittee in a lot of other um, districts and that's a little bit of semantics because those are still um, governed by open meeting law these are other subcommittees or appointments. Um, there was a data trends subcommittee that um, in my, to my knowledge has not met in over three years, um, but that charge was, um, that was established back in 2014 to recommend data trends for measurement and reports to school committee. Um, but as I mentioned, that hasn't been happening. We have our warrant authorization representatives, um, Ms. Spitzer for the Regional School Committee, um, the representatives for the Collaborative for Education, and I believe these are our, our reps. Um, and then we have liaisons for our, the advisory committees, the CPAC and the um, Bilingual Parent Advisory Council. Um, so that, I think, is all of our... One more. <laughs> we also have, um, and I don't know who volunteered to do that for us this year, the Clerical Merit Award selection. Mr. Denling, thank you. Um, we um, are in normal years when there is an annual MASC conference, so Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, we send a delegate um, to represent us um, as a voting member there. Um, there's a professional leave request representative and a regional assessment working group rep, which I don't believe that that, um, also, I also believe that that hasn't really um, been meeting. So a lot, um, <laughs> a lot of various ones um, and a lot of, uh, oh, Dr. Morris. Yeah, I think Ms. Spitzer had a question about Amherst Media Rep and that is, um, that comes from the Amherst School Committee not from the regional school committee. So that's, I, I imagine I didn't, I didn't put this together, Ms. McDonald did, but I think that might not be listed here because these are from the regional school committee because that's the meeting that's meeting tonight. But it, it is something that another committee has a representative on. And that other committee also has some other um, appointments for, to, to liaise with the town with, for um, budget and capital plan. So. Um, so I, I also note that we we tend to be um, very flexible in our definition of what is a subcommittee, um, where versus sort of what it looks like other districts um, treat and and look at that. So these were the questions that I, I posed as sort of to get us started on the conversation. As um, for these subcommittees, it, 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 there's a couple, um, you know, wrapped up in is the charge still relevant, but also related to that is that do we need that subcommittee? Um, 
are there changes that we want to make to either the subcommittee charge um, or the subcommittee structure, um, membership? Um, I'm happy to sort of, um, we've, we've had a change in um, representation from the town of Leverett. So um, Leverett is, is noticeably missing on any of this, the um, uh, subcommittees. Um, and then the other question is, do we want to consider changes in our policy, um, whether needed um, or, or desired um, as it relates to both subcommittees and or advisory committees? So I'm going to stop sharing so I can actually see you all um, better. Thoughts? Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, Jean, you'll be very excited to hear this, that besides committees that require the chair to be on them. The only subcommittee we have that actually has an unofficial official requirement is the superintendent evaluation committee, which we decided in 2018 would be one member from each town. So congratulations. I volunteer for that committee. Mr. Um, so, yeah, so thank you for bringing this up. I think I feel like this falls under the general umbrella of um, school committee running itself um, more consciously and officially, officially and according to its own rules. Um, uh, if, if you've ever tried to go through all of, the, all of our policies, we do have quite the um, uh, quite the overlapping set of of policy and some some of them that we haven't revisited in quite quite a number of years, um, so it's 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 good it's good to get this refresh um, and it's a good time for it too. I mean I'm not super surprised that given the kind of emergency crisis footing that we've been on for the last year and a half that we haven't gotten around to this. So I don't feel terribly bad <laughs> that it's taken this long, but but you know now that we're kind of like emerging uh, from that, I, I feel like this is a good opportunity. So yeah, I mean my my initial thoughts on this. Are, it certainly makes sense at a bare minimum that we should be refreshing our practices for our current subcommittees to be in line with the policies that we currently have. Um, so in terms of, you know, membership requirements about being uh, either on the committee or a resident from our member town or a, a staff uh, member, you, could, you know, should certainly refresh and, and apply that. Um, and um, I, I do remember, I don't think we did it this past year, but typically and this was more common before uh, Amherst's government switched over and we were all sort of on a similar Springtown meeting cycles that after all those um, new school committee members came on, we would do a, okay, here's the spreadsheet list of subcommittees, who's gonna do what for the next year? And we kind of went down the, the list. So this, the idea of annually refreshing membership, I think makes a lot of sense, not only for school committee members, but for, for any public members that are gonna uh, contribute. Um, and then I, I think categorizing uh, a, a bit more accurately um, uh, our different or, uh, subgroups here in terms of what they are, I think would really help not just the committee function, but for, for public participation as well. Um, uh, you know, like you said, we have some groups that are actually true subcommittees. We have some others that are really just individual appointments or contributions. You know, CPAC is is its own group and we have a liaison. So it's not a subcommittee of the school committee, but it's still a very important similar thing. Um, same thing with LPAC. Um, you know, SETF has its is is you know a group that's been around for a long, long time, 2014, I think it was uh, initially um set. And um, you know, some some of the original members there too. So I think, you know, certainly that's that's it seems like it, that's more aligned with what that MASC reference policy was talking about in terms of advisory committees. So um you know that's a lot of administrative questions with a lot of answers, but I do think I do think this is the time to kind of identify, you know, and and, and just kind of chunk chunk at it, right? Let's 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 apply our current policies and then and then and then go go for a kind of a cleaner organization of what we have, um, you know, ho hopefully so that when we get restarted with next year, you know, we can we can kind of execute on a on a cleaner slate. 
You're reminding me of one other key difference between our policy and sort of other model, both the model policy as well as other district policy is that our policy says that members are appointed by the chair. Um, most the model policy and others say that it's um, appointed by the chair with the approval of the committee. So it's a notable, um, <laughs> not that I would uh, willy nilly just appoint people without asking you all, but um, but it is something that that's missing in our policy, I think. Um, so um, another key point. The Amherst election cycle um, being now in November with new members being seated in January as opposed to the former where everybody was probably newly appointed or elected at about the same time, the same couple of months, makes it a little bit challenging for us to think about an annual appointment, but um, it just means we have to be flexible, I suppose. But any other ideas? And are you raising your hand or scratching your ear? Yep, scratching my ear. <laughs> Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm generally in favor of us, for lack of a better term, kind of cleaning up the list. I guess partially, um, we all just bear there's a lot of work that comes with being a school committee member. So to the extent that we can potentially reduce the the administrative burden on any of us and let us focus more on, on core issues, I think that's important. That said, I, I mean, um, I, I really would like the idea that we continually, not continually, but at least annually look at membership, mainly just because I, I if you look at that list, some of our names appear a lot more often than other people's names. So I think to the extent that we can evenly distribute the burden of subcommittee work across um, the membership of, of the school committee, I think that's important. Um, and I would encourage us to, to at least annually do that. Mr. Emily? I, th I think another opportunity here too is with this, the idea of um, of uh, re residents. So you know, what, what do residents of our member towns? How can they contribute? I can imagine some other opportunities other than the committees that we uh, the groups that we already have uh, contributing. You know, if if there are uh, members of the public who have a particular interest in in budgeting, you know, you one could imagine um, uh, them joining the the budget subcommittee and 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 providing some meaningful. Um, positive, you know, contributions um, in that regard, or or data trends, you know, so, so or you know, so we have we have the concept on NCTF, we have the concept on um, CPAC, even though it's not a, a, a subcommittee. Um, so I'm just thinking if if um, one benefit of sort of making this a lot clearer and, and transparent about about what are the opportunities to engage with and provide input uh, to the committee, because um, you know I do because it's 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 another sort of side topic, right? Is how to how do you provide input to um, meaningfully, uh, other than public comment and emailing us uh, to, to the committee? And if you have a particular interest, whether that's equity or um, or data trends or budget, whatnot, this could be another opportunity where we say, "Hey, here's an opportunity." And and you know, every, and every year we talk about here's, you know, here's where we're at, you know, and we welcome you know people. It could be a could be a nice thing. I think one one thing um, that strikes me though is I think we get we get blurry and 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 it gets sort of unclear both with within our committee as well as with the community this this definitional of whether it's a subcommittee or something else and whether it's only school committee members and therefore a public meeting or only community members or predominantly community members and i think we have significant opportunity to sort of help ourselves as well as the community in understanding how we do the work that we do by sort of teasing that apart a little bit so that um, you know, following the, what you see in a lot of other communities is that the subcommittees is really how the school committee conducts its work. Um, and you know, not that we would be taking that out of the full committee, but that the subcommittee is for progressing the work in between the full committee meetings. 
um, sort of much as what we just assigned some work that um, Ms. Stancer and, and Ms. Lord are taking on, and that where we want sort of community engagement and, and sort of, you know, in, in an advisory and a reporting mechanism, that we use a different um, structure um, and group structure and definition for that so that it's clear that the subcommittee is elected by elected members conducting the work of the school committee and the advisory committees are really just that and I think by by having sort of the, this sort of mix you know this subcommittee designation and some are serving this purpose and some are serving another purpose can become challenging for for all of us to keep track of I think so I, I see that as an opportunity I see a couple of hands I don't know if it was Miss Stancer first and then Mr. Sullivan yep. Mr. Sullivan I'm just curious as we're talking about subcommittees and that the Shootsbury town meeting is coming up on the 12th we had talked about during the budget season of creating a school committee assessment committee to make the final decision on what we thought should happen i was just curious if we were going to try and do that this summer or not so the, I, I sort of interpret the question as should we have a regional assessment working group again so sort of revive and refresh that group well we i think it was mr demling who brought it up that he felt that and i i totally agreed with him that the school committee should be the working group and others can join but we would be the main body miss dancer um i think in that in that discussion or conversation, whatever it was, part of it was how do we educate the community about our budget process? Um, and I, because at those assessment meetings uh, with, with the new town counselors, there was a sense that a lot of those people were not at all familiar with the assessment method or anything like that. So um, that was one of the things I. Um, that I'm sort of holding out, waiting, because it, there hasn't been a good time to talk with Dr. Slaughter about how we can describe the budget or the budgeting process in a way that's a little easier for the public to understand. Um, so that was kind of my recollection of that discussion. What are um, other folks' thoughts about this um, structure of our subcommittees, which subcommittees, our policy? <laughs> Mr. Stamel. Well, uh, to be, you know, to be blatantly honest, um, <laughs> um, I was, I, I, I know guilt really well. I was brought up with, with plenty of it. So I, I feel as though I'll need to join a subcommittee. Uh, but, it, it, you know, I didn't go 10 rounds with all my fellow Leverett uh, school committee members to get on the regional committee, believe it or not. I, I did volunteer to, to be on this subcommittee. So I thought it, twice a month in fairly long meetings was my kind of, that was my amount of subcommittee uh, duties. So uh, the idea of being on another subcommittee surprises me. I mean, I but I also see that people are putting in a lot of work. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm re I would reluctantly join a subcommittee. I'd certainly want to know how much, how many, how often certain subcommittees meet, and uh, what you know what the expectations are for subcommittees. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was one of the key next steps is I'll share out that the actual spreadsheet because some of that information is in there. But, uh, and again, I would say that we haven't looked at that in over a year. So, um, cause we've been in COVID time. So, um, so just because that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's 
the way it is um, right now, but it's a starting point. Um, looking at folks that haven't yet spoken, um, Ms. Lord, Ms. Kenny, or Mr. Hannington, you have thoughts? I, I want to say I appreciate the work you've done so that I could understand better about the role of a subcommittee or how other school systems are doing it. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have much more valuable to offer beyond that um, because I, I, I looked at the slides and I was like, wow, there's a lot of things I didn't quite understand. I'm glad to know better and I'm here for the discussion in any way we wanna um, shape our efficiency and our, our phenomenal work. <laughs> Just, I claim it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's all. So is this, um, you know, as, a, as potential next steps, is this something that um, the committee would like to refer to the policy subcommittee to look at um, our current policy, um, whether we want to establish advisory committees separate from subcommittees? Seeing some nodding heads. And as it happens, the, sub, the policy committee is meeting this week. Um, we have another policy on tonight's agenda that was not the intent um, for the policy subcommittee, just to be clear. But um, the, um, what, I'll share this, this spreadsheet, the full spreadsheet. And um, I think maybe um, at one of our end of June ones, we can come meetings, we can come back to this. Um, discussion again um, with input from the policy subcommittee at that point, if that makes sense for folks. A lot of, I know this is scintillating conversation, so um, I, I, <laughs> I can just read it on your faces. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sensing thumbs up for those next steps. Okay, great. Moving on, um, as I referenced, we have a proposed um, first read of a revision to our policy EBCFA on face coverings. Um, and those, both the current and the proposed revision are included in the packet. Um, and as a reminder for folks um, new to the committee, um, Policy EBCFA was one that we adopted a year ago um, in COVID. Um, it is um, nearly identical to the model policy that was developed by the MASC um, regarding face coverings. And there is a proposal now to revise it effective July 1st. And uh, can I speak to this, Ms. McDonald? Yes. Yeah, and so this was developed in consultation with, you know, legal counsel and, and just the ever-changing, some of the challenges that we've experienced this year um, and the fact that guidance continues to change um, and um, policy is not intended to change as frequently as perhaps guidance has shifted. So it's trying to align the district's work with the recommendations um, from, you know, the state, both the Department of Public Health and uh, from DESE so that it, it gives um, the ability for us to be nimble um, as things are loosening up. Who knows in the future, they may tighten up again, right? We, there's lots of things we don't know. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll just go through it very briefly if it's okay, it's very short. Um, so it says starting on December, on July 1st, excuse me, 2021, the districts will follow the face covering guidance from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, DPH, and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, the superintendent will manage the interpretation and implementation of guidance. this guidance. In the short term, it means three things for our summer programs. Uh, the first thing is that students would no longer to be, need to be masked when they're outside in our summer programs. This is the current guidance uh, department has. This would look to implement it for all of our programming uh, in the summer. Uh, secondly, would be that staff members who are working in our summer programs, if they were distanced, uh, would not also not need to wear face coverings uh, if they were outside during our summer programs. That's a little different. Students, it's um, distancing is not part of the uh, 
uh, kind of face covering or not, but for adults it is for summer programs. And that's, uh, again, the recommendations we received or the guidelines from the state. And the last one is uh, in the non-school setting, so primarily in central office, we'd be following the kind of sector specific or sector general guidance, excuse me, uh, coming from the state, which is vaccinated people would not need to wear masks in indoor settings, but unvaccinated people would need to wear masks in indoor settings. So those are the three distinct implications for the summer. Uh, what the state said last week is they will be putting out uh, face covering guidance in the summer for the fall. We don't know what that is yet, um, but um, you know the short-term implications are the three I mentioned. Um, I will say personally, I think aligning with the state guidance is the recommendation we've received from the local health director um, that when we sort of create our own policies, uh, we have discordance between uh, what's happening at the state level and uh, what's happening locally it creates some challenges. And I'll give one tangible example and then just open up for questions or comments. Um, the most recent state guidance is that contact tracing um, should only be done for folks within a certain distance, only indoors. So in other words, the, the kind of past practice of contract tracing when folks are outside is no longer the Department of Health recommendation in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And so since our town, uh, that contract tracing is primarily done by the town's contract tracer, if we have different rules or different methodologies, then the contract tracer, and this has come up this spring a couple of times, uh, it leads to some challenges where we're, we're not working with the same rules uh, as the, the town is or the contract tracing from DPH is. So this is for me an effort to align our work with the department here in Massachusetts, uh, as well as frankly other districts in Massachusetts as well. So that's sort of the thinking, you know, I think what I'd ask whatever this policy ends up is if it is possible to be voted at the next regional meeting, which is the 15th, which actually would be a joint meeting, uh, that'll give us enough time to inform staff members, families of whatever the rules will be on face on face coverings uh, for summer programs, because uh, I don't want to do a last minute notification of them. And our, our summer programs start on July 6th. So it gives us a little bit of time to both communicate out uh, as well as to develop guidelines uh, for use. So uh, that's this is the first draft. It's it's uh, unbelievably short as it relates to policy. Um, so that doesn't mean it doesn't have uh, broad implications. So wanted to bring it to the committee tonight, uh, see if the committee had thoughts so that we would have enough time to make edits before a potential second read and vote two weeks from now, uh, again, on whatever the policy ends up being. Questions? Comments on the policy, Ms. Stancer? Um, I guess I would just say that I think we learned over the course of this past year that flexibility is is important. Um, that when things are written so strictly, it leaves no room for variation, and and um, I think some flexibility is important um, in in this this situation. And I think this change would be a good one. Ms. Kenny. Uh, I agree with Ms. Dancer. I think flexibility is is key. Uh, and I also think that uh, putting our policies and our practices more in line with uh, the Department of Health and uh, other public agencies that know far more about changing pandemic issues than I do or you know, I don't work in, in healthcare, um, I think is a really good idea. So I am in full support of updating this policy. Mr. Demling? Yeah, I mean, I agree. Um, you know, w w the state is in a much different place than it was um, a few months before school began last, last September, where they were really late and drip, drip, dripping with with their guidance to us, and so we they, they sort of forced the hands of many districts, including ourselves, to to you know define very specific policies. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean the flexibility is 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 what we need going forward in terms of minimizing the potential disruption to student services. Um, I also think that 
I mean, if the state ever really went off the reservation, Desi, and, and it did something that we all felt very strongly was wrong, there's nothing that prevents us at our next meeting from passing a policy, from proposing and then passing a policy. So, you know, it's not like we're giving up that authority. We're just not statically defining what we project is the appropriate public health guidance, which I think given this point of stability, not that we're completely out of the woods of COVID, I'm not nearly suggesting that, um, but given the relative point of stability what we are at with this experience, um, uh, deferring to the Department of Public Health, I think makes um, all the sense in the world. Ms. Spitzer? I don't have much to add other than to say, you know, I, I agree with following the guidance from the Department of Public Health. I also feel like the communication around this is going to be really important. So not so much about whether or not I think this is the right policy, but if it's okay to talk about adjacently, I think implementing this is going to be tricky because a lot of um, community members, I think, will have, um, I mean, we've, we've been getting email communication from community members who wish we'd move faster with um, shifting towards the state guidance. Um, but I do believe that, the, I, you know, personally talking about folks who are going into, you know, new environments without masks, you know, there's a lot of anxiety around this. And so I think just communicating and making sure that we are affirming that anybody who still desires to wear a mask can wear a mask and, and just making sure that we allow people to, you know, have some grace during the transition. <laughs> So we're not um, planning. So to follow our policy on policy, <laughs> we um, we don't we review policy um, as a first read. Any any um, requests to for edits or updates to the language in the policy, we refer to the policy subcommittee, and then at a second read is where we consider a vote. Um, so just to be clear, so I'm not hearing any sort of edits on the on the wording or phrasing of the policy itself. Is that correct? People are generally on board with that. Dr. Morris, did you? Yeah, I just, I wanna highlight, I think, Ms. Spitzer's point, which is incredibly important. And that's really why, you know, I feel like I'm pushing at a time of year where there's lots of things uh, that need to get done to try to have this resolved on the 15th is that it gives us time to communicate while well, school is still in session. Uh, about this for for summer program for families that may be considering whether they want to come in you know it's for our special ed program it's the last opportunity for virtual school for families who want that and if this is a factor then certainly we want to communicate that in enough time where families can make you know uh, the best decision for their themselves and their child um, so I think that's really the thinking of trying to uh, be able to have this vote uh, with enough time where we're able to let folks know that that's what's planned. So I just wanted to highlight that point because I think it's, it's really important. And it's going to be really important throughout, like in the summer when DESE finally and the Department of Public Health does have their face covering guidance. I mean, you might have seen that, you know, they came out with some, there was a parenthetical expression in uh, a DESE document last week that then garnered lots of attention and, and lots of thoughts uh, from many stakeholder groups. So we know it'll have a lot of attention, uh, you know, down the road, but certainly for our summer programs, we want to communicate as much as possible. And the other thing I wanted to say really clearly is we're not uh, in a place where we, the district, will have a vaccine passport program. We'll be, you know, we're a district. We're not the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth at this point, unlike, you know, New York is the only sort of other uh, counterexample to it, doesn't have a system around that. Um, so, you know, we want to also be really clear in terms of the office side that, you know, we will, you know, uh, that's going to be a challenge, but it's going to be a bit challenge everywhere as well. And I think it's, you know, we started talking about at a leadership level today about how do we make sure people feel comfortable both wearing a mask if they choose to, regardless of their vaccination status, that there's there's no pressure to, to make any decision that people are uncomfortable with as long as it fits within the guidelines. So, you know, I think that communication piece and that kind of sensitivity to the fact that people may be in really different places on it. And, you know, I think was well articulated in an article I read this week and um, that for unvaccinated folks, this may be uh, a different experience and, and they may want to, you know, mask up in a different way uh, than they did before as uh, more unvaccinated, more vaccinated people uh, may be unmasking. So I think all of that is we want to approach this as sensitively and carefully as possible and have our communication be as clear as possible to all stakeholder groups. Sorry, it's long-winded, but I just, I'm just i glad you mentioned that because I think it's critical. Mr. Demling? 
And the only, the only other point on this that, and, and I don't know if this needs to go into the policy or not, but it certainly needs to go into the communication is that, and this is just how I feel, though I have no reason to believe anybody else in the committee feels differently. If people or staff, if students or staff want to wear a mask, if it's not required, that it's not only okay, it's <clears throat> totally supported and encouraged in a stigma-free environment. I mean, I totally, I believe in vaccines as much as anybody, but somebody wants to wear nine masks and a hazmat suit, like, you know, it's, it's, it's your own feeling, you know, it's your own experience. And, um, you know, and where, and in addition to people being in different places in a poss possibly immun immunocompromised situation, people are in different emotional places and different places with their experience with COVID, you know, I mean, it's certainly not inconsistent to be completely um, believing of the vaccine science and yet still want to wear a mask outside. You know, that's 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 a valid human choice. Um, so I'm, again, I'm sure everybody feels that way, um, but I, I feel like when we're when we're going to the point of like lifting all requirements, which is it's or, or many or most of the requirement mask requirements of the past, which sounds like what Desi is doing, um, I, I think we just want to make sure we're always emphasizing that point. Any other um, comments? So we'll um, look at this again um, and consider a vote at our uh, June 15th meeting. Which brings us to the next topic, <laughs> which is future agenda planning. So we have a meeting right now um, planned for, sorry, I, can't, I keep losing my cursor. Um, I think because I moved, there it is, yeah. um, for the 15th, um, that is planned to be a joint meeting um, with the Amherst School Committee and the Pelham School Committee, um, where we'll hear the um, artifacts presentation um, to support the superintendent evaluation. Um, we'll also be looking at um, in hearing about the return to school guidance from DESE, which we expect to have by then, hopefully. Um, and then the possible vote for um, this, this uh, face covering policy. So those are the joint topics. Then the region, we will continue um, on our own, um, come back to the subcommittee policy and structure. Any next step, continuing discussion on that. Um, would also like to talk about um, our summer meetings um, and I should say retreat because um, I uh, well that, that'll be what we talk about is whether we meet over the summer <laughs> um, as well as um, our proposed meeting calendar for 21 for the next school year um, and then potentially if needed an executive session of negotiations Did we miss anything Mr. Stamel. I'll probably just, I don't, I don't know if the sixth grade uh, topic will come up, but I'll probably want to say something, whether it might be very little about our yep. discussion. Good point. It may, but uh, it's probably wise to, for us to just have that sort of as a standing one, even if we don't need it, we can just always move very quickly right through that agenda item. Okay. Great. And just as a reminder, so that you're mentally prepared, um, that after that uh, superintendent artifacts presentation, we will be going um, from there into, we'll have one week to com complete our evaluation based on the, that artifacts presentation. Um, so just sort of be, just know that it's a, it's a short fuse, a pretty short fuse this year. If there's nothing else, then we can move on to the next item, which is our warrant report. Um, so, Ms. Spitzer, do you have warrants to share with us? I do indeed. Um, just give me one moment. One. Okay. So, I have four, but I'm having trouble. Oh, it looks like I've got one twice. Okay, so that's the explanation. Okay, so I only have three. 
Um, so I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $212,810.02 for the warrant dated May 19th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $199,367.27, revolving fund expenses of $824, and grant fund expenses of $12,618.75. And this was signed by me on May 20th, 2021. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $223,728.08 for the warrant dated May 25th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $194,613.32 revolving fund expenses of $22,661.13 and grant fund expenses of $5,734.53 and other funds in the amount of $719.10. This was signed by me on May 25th, 2021. I um, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $411,511 dollars and 37 cents for the warrant dated May 28th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $376,758.99, revolving fund expenses of $2,354.40, grant fund expenses of $31,897.98, and other funds in the amount of $500. And this was signed by me on June 1st, 2021. Thanks. And um, next up, we uh, have some gifts to accept, and those were added to the packet. Um, I will make a motion. Um, I'll move that we accept the following gifts um, from donor Anthony Brackett to support 2018 Summer Blast Bass Bass Clarinet Number 1430 LP with accessories for the middle school and high school band program, estimated um, amount of $1,750. From Barbara and James Pistrang, number 2677, to support the FY21 Arms Ultimate Scholarship in the amount of $1,000. From Gardner's Supply, to support a gift card for Summit Academy students with a value of $250 for a total cash value of $1,000. Is there a second? Second. Met by McDonald and seconded by Spitzer. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. Um, Mr. Demley. Demley, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Stammel? Stammel, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. And the motion passes unanimously. And I believe we are now, yes. Um, so, um, I move that we enter into executive session according to MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21.3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the APEA. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body, and the chair so declares, and I declare, with no intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Lord, second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. We will now take a roll call vote. Mr. Demley. Demley, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Stammel. Stammel, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. So we are adjourning to executive session. Thank you, Amherst Media.